family and tell you that um, these Wednesday evening midweek devotionals have been really special to me. And I want to update you on three things. I haven't been like making announcements, just teaching, but I do want to share three things with you in this week's devotional before we dive into God's Word. Uh, the first thing is this is our eighth or ninth time to do this. And you may not have noticed, but I've never ever mentioned anything about giving during a midweek devotional. And what I want, do, I want to do is take this time just to tell you personally, thank you for your massive generosity. As a church family, you've continued to tithe faithfully. And so many of you have given above the tithe to two different places as offerings. And honestly, this isn't giving to the church as much as this is giving through the church. There may be those of you who haven't given yet and would like to, you can go to the Life Church app or you can go to life.church and you can give online in those ways. The two places that we're looking at offerings right now, one of them is called Digital Missions. Uh, if you've been following the story, we've been giving away the Life Church online platform to churches for years and years now. And Pastor Stephen, we had 3,000 churches that were using this platform. Yeah. As soon as churches were unable to meet in physical locations, that number went up to now over 25,000 <laughs> churches are signed up to use the free Life Church platform. And the good news is, it's completely free to them, but it is not free to us. Uh, there is a much higher cost to us, but we recognize the higher cost and believe it's a higher calling. Those of you giving toward digital missions, you're helping us to fund the ministry that helps 25,000 churches. Our cost has gone up about five times normal, and I'm so grateful because of your generosity. You're empowering us to do that, and I wanted to say thank you. Also, a lot of you are giving to COVID-19 response, and we've been able to do so much to help people in our communities and around the world. I just wanted to share with you what your giving has done. In addition to what we normally do through Samaritan's Purse and Convoy of Hope and other ministries like that around the world, in addition to what we normally do locally, um, we've been able to eliminate, this is pretty amazing, but $5 million worth of medical debt to yeah. COVID-19 heroes. And I'm so thankful to you and their families are thankful to you as well. In addition to eliminating that debt, We've been able to take, because of your generosity, $1.8 million or so to pour into local mission partners and different organizations in the communities where Life Church cities, um, where we meet in Life Church cities. We've been able to give generous donations to different food banks, uh, provide 50,000 masks for organizations that are in need. Uh, we're funding nursing homes to help them have iPads and laptops to support virtual visits. Last week, we gave $100,000 in total to four different hospitals to help um, child care for hospital workers, to help give them um, hotel money when they need to isolate and for counseling for those who feel overwhelmed. A new goal that we have is continuing to fund the many church members who will be needing financial support in this time. And so part of your giving to COVID-19 will go to meet the needs of church families that are hurting. And the other goal that we're working toward is to help local churches. Our Life Group's missions pastors are looking into local churches in our communities that have been especially hit financially. And because of your generosity, we'll be targeting at least 20 churches with very generous gifts to help meet needs in the lives of those churches during this time. Again, I just wanna say thank you. Isn't it amazing that we can lead the way with irrational generosity because as a church, we truly believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. Second quick um, point of communication. Um, in certain Life Church communities, if, if you're not familiar, we are currently in 10 different states, in 34 different cities. There were some communities where churches were allowed to meet last weekend. We chose not to, even though we would have been allowed to because we were not quite prepared. This weekend, the good news is in several of our communities, we will be prepared to reopen the doors of the physical churches. Uh, just to tell you, it'll be a little bit different. It'll be a lot different. It'll be a touchless experience where you don't have to touch a door, no refreshments, no handshakes. We'll do like elbow bumps if you want, distant high fives, air hugs, whatever you want. Just be creative, be incredibly friendly. There will not be any Life Kids ministry. 
I would encourage you to bring a mask if you have one. We'll have extras if you don't have one. And we're going to really distance the seating. I promise you this will be safer than going to Lowe's or Walmart or wherever you've been. We're gonna be very, very, very safe for those who choose to come because there's gonna be limited seating and we don't know what to expect. We're asking you to please RSVP to reserve a seat. You can go to the Life Church app or you can go to life.church and you can click on the banner and then you can get three seats, four seats, five seats, whatever you need. And that would mean a lot to us so that we can help spread people out and make sure that the services are very, very safe. So don't forget to RSVP. Now, last thing before we teach is this will be the last midweek service. Thank you. I've had uh, several of you say, hey, can we keep doing this? Can we keep doing this? And for those of you that have been blessed by it, we're sincerely thankful, but no, we're not gonna keep doing this. Um, From the very beginning of the church, we decided to have a very streamlined model of ministry. And what we want people doing is we want people to worship on the weekends. We want people serving, using their gifts, and we want people involved in community, in small groups. And we're going to be able to do even more of that again in the very near future. So this will be the last one. With that in mind, I've entitled this message, Put Your Hope in God. Put Your Hope in God. I read an article somewhere this week. I wish I could quote the source, but uh, the author defined hope this way. The author said that desire plus probability equals hope. In other words, if there's something that we want and there's a high probability that we'll get what we want, then we have a lot of hope. If on the other hand, we really want something, but there's a very low probability that we'll receive what we want, we really don't have much hope at all. Unfortunately, there are a lot of hopeless people around. Those who have been unemployed for a long time or lived in poverty for a long time or battled depression for a long time or maybe have been in an abusive situation for a long time, they often lose hope. Those who've been quarantined for a long time and have lost the rhythms of a normal everyday life, I know there are some people that are losing hope. I wanna look at two different scriptures today. The first one is from the psalmist in Psalm 43, verse five. And the psalmist asked the question, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Pastor Stephen, I don't know about you, but there have been times in this last eight or nine or 10 weeks, I was quarantined before everything was shut down for a two week strict quarantine, that I've felt unusually discouraged. My, um, my emotions have been on edge. And there are times when I just, I could say that, like, wh- why? I mean, I'm, I'm healthy, my family's here, I've still got good friends. Why, why, why am I struggling emotionally? Why, why am I so downcast? Why so disturbed with, within me? And the psalmist then, almost as if talking himself into faith says, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Put your hope in God. We we have a desire and the likelihood of it happening, the probability determines the level of our hope. Some of you right now, you might be a little lower on hope. Maybe your big desire is, I just want life to get back to normal. I just wanna be able to go to the movie theater, my favorite restaurant, or get away with my family, or meet with some people that I love, or hug somebody in my family that I've been unable to hug. I just want life to go back to normal. And yet, when you look at the near future, the probability of that doesn't seem really high. I mean, it's like, we're opening up some places and some parts of the country and other places won't open for a long time. And there's lots of fear and there's a divided nation and there's all this tension and so many unanswered questions. And you may desire something, but the probability of which you desire seems so low that you just really don't feel like you have a lot of hope. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. I wanna look at another Psalm, Psalm 37 verse four, when David said this, I love this verse. He said, take delight in the Lord. Another version says, delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourselves in the Lord. That word delight in the Hebrew language, it it comes from the word anag. And it, it, it means to enjoy, like enjoy the presence of God, but Hebrew words are interesting. They're almost like little picture words or like little stories. They're like there's, It's almost like a, a full sentence or a whole thought. And this word, it, it, it means to be made soft or pliable. In other words, as you're enjoying the presence of God, your heart softens toward the desires of God. And as you delight in the Lord, you become soft, you become pliable. He will give you the desires of your heart. 
desire plus probability equals hope. Now, what does this verse mean? Delight yourselves in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Some people say, well, then God will give you whatever you desire. You know, you, you, he'll give you whatever you desire. Other scholars say it really means this, as you enjoy the presence of God, you become soft and pliable and God actually puts his desires in you. And when you desire what he wants you to desire, he will give you the desires of your heart. Essentially, he's giving you the desires of his heart, which is in your heart. I like that. Whenever we enjoy the presence of God, whenever we seek him, whenever we call on him, whenever we become desperate for him, whenever we really, really need him, we become soft, we become pliable. And then we're not just wanting our desires, give me my desires, because the probability may be low that I get what I want. Therefore, I don't have a lot of hope. But when I'm downcast and I put my hope in God, my hope is not in my desired outcome, but my hope is in the goodness and the character and the nature of a very, very good and very real God. And then my heart is made soft or pliable and he gives me his desires. I want what he wants. And the more time I spend with God and the softer my heart becomes, I stop wanting just the temporary things of this world, but I start desiring the things of the kingdom of God. I want to be more like Jesus. I wanna be more full of the fruits of the Spirit. I wanna be more full of love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. I wanna reflect His glory. I want less of this world and I want more of what truly honors God. If you're hurting, if you feel a little bit hopeless today, I'm wondering, do any of you have a love-hate relationship with social media? I'm curious, do, do any of you like with maybe Instagram or Facebook, whatever your, your, your source is, do you have a love-hate relationship with it? Okay, like I love the fact that I can stay in touch with what's going on in the lives of my friends and see their funny, silly pictures and be inspired and see who's having kids or what their kids are doing. I love that part of it, but sometimes I hate it. I hate it when one, I get sucked into it for too long or when I'm having a perfectly good day and someone else is having a better day than mine and then suddenly I feel like my life sucks. Does that happen to any of you ever? Like you, you, you start to compare and you feel like my life is not going so good at all? I wanna talk about a little bit about the curse of comparing and a thought we've covered before is this, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. The very fastest way to kill something that's otherwise very special and meaningful is to compare it to someone else. I don't know about you, but I don't just compare what someone else has. Like I know some people like, she's got more shoes than Nordstrom's and I hate that. Or, you know, it used to be when you could go on vacations, like isn't that his third vacation of the year? And I'm not going anywhere. Like the only place I'm going is like Los Backyardos, you know, or whatever. And I don't just compare, you know, what someone has or, or where they're going. But the thing that gets me sometimes is when I compare what they can do that I can't do talented people that are good at so many different things. Uh, for example, there are a lot of things I'm not good at. One is I'm not handy. Like I, you, you could say I'm mecha mechanically challenged. I can't fix anything. I can barely fix a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> and another thing is like, I can't sing at all. Those of you that watch the midweek service, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time, there's a little commercial for it. Yes, that was intentional. That my friends say like, why are you always reaching down and playing with the side of your pants? The reason is I'm turning my microphone off before so one of our worship, before Pastor Stephen leaves us in worship because I can't sing. If my, you heard my vocals, you probably never come back to church ever. You might not follow God if you heard my vocals are so bad. I'm, I, I can't fix anything and I can't sing What's a problem for me though is my bride, Amy, really seems to appreciate when someone repairs something, makes something, or has a great voice. And sometimes that makes me feel a little bit inadequate. She'll say something like, hey, we should go see so-and-so. You know, her husband made this amazing table and chairs from like the ground up. And it's like, so incredible. And he rewired the house and did an add-on. I'm like, yeah, but. Can he preach a sermon? Probably not. 
but she gets so excited about that. Like, or she's like, oh, his voice is so amazing. Did you hear his voice? I'm like, uh, yeah, but I swear he can't do nunchucks. I promise you he can't do nunchucks. And I find myself comparing sometimes and feeling a little bit inadequate, the curse of comparing, because I can't do what they can do. If you've ever felt like that, the reason you can't do what someone else can do is because you weren't called to their purpose. You weren't created by God to do what they were created by God to do. That's why the title of today's message is Stop Comparing Your Calling. Whatever you do, stop comparing your calling to someone else's. Let's pray wherever you are. Father, we ask that your spirit would speak an empowering word to our hearts today that your word would build up our faith with confidence that we are created by you to do what you called us to do, to serve your purpose. We don't need to compare, but God, to be satisfied, excited, and fulfilled by your purpose for us. God, speak to us and build our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Type it in, come on, just type it in, amen, amen. Let's, let's review. We're in a message series called There Is A Reason, in the first week, we talked about the purpose in your pain. Sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. In other words, if you're hurting, there is a purpose in your pain. Last week, we looked at three principles. Your purpose is not for you. Your purpose is for God. It's not about you, it's about Him. We looked at this, that you don't find your purpose, you serve God's purpose. If you wanna serve God's purpose, you start serving God's people. Today, I wanna to add two additional thoughts. The first one is this. I hope you'll embrace this, internalize this, live this, that you are perfectly created by God to fulfill God's purpose for you. You have everything you need to do everything that God created you to do. You are perfectly designed by the great designer to fulfill his divine purpose for you. In fact, the Apostle Paul said this to the believers in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. He said, for we are God's masterpiece. I love that, we're his masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we could do good things he planned for us long ago. This is an amazing thought to recognize, Pastor Stephen, that long before you were born, God gave you the gifts that you have to do what you just did today because you are his masterpiece. In fact, the Greek word to all of you husbands who can make tables and chairs, the Greek word for masterpiece is poem. I bet you didn't know that, how about that? And it means, it means like the poetic work, like you, you are the poetic statement of God because he created you exactly as he wanted you to fulfill his purpose. I love this bumper sticker I saw that said on the back of a car, it said, God don't create no junk. I hope you'll realize that. God knew exactly what he was doing when he made you, you were not an accident. God don't create no junk. The only problem with that bumper sticker, it was on a junker car, but that's beside the point. God doesn't create any junk, you're not an accident. Everything that God creates, he creates for a purpose. In other words, your birth is evidence that your purpose is necessary. There is no substitute for you. You are perfectly designed by God to fulfill his very specific purpose for you. Now, because you're created by God and for God, we're to do everything for his glory, for him. It's not for us, it's for him. The problem is so many of us, we end up doing things for our own reasons or for somebody else. We, we, will, we will do it for someone else's approval or we're trying to impress them. Like, who, who are you doing that for? Well, I'm doing it for them because of what they think. I'm wondering, who's them? And why do you care about what they think? They're like, who's they? Who, who, are, who are they? Well, I just, I want, to, I, want to, I want them to like me. Who's them? If you, they like you today, they may not like you tomorrow and them's gonna change and they're gonna change as you go through life anyway, but we're doing it for their approval so that they will like us. Here's the challenge. Comparison is the enemy of calling. Anytime we start to compare what someone else is doing and what they think, this robs us of our calling. Comparison is the enemy of calling. Why? Number two, because you can't fulfill God's purpose for you when you're comparing to someone else. You'll never be able to do what God uniquely created you to do when you're always looking at what she's doing, what he's doing, what they're doing, what they think. 
You can't fulfill your calling when you're comparing to somebody else. In fact, I wanna show you one of my favorite funny portions of scripture. Not only is the Bible living and active and sharp and convicts and corrects and encourages and inspires, but it's funny. If you read the Bible, you should read the Bible. There's some really, really funny stuff in here. You'll be changed and you might even laugh if you read it right. I'll show you a portion in John 20 that's just hilarious to me. It's about John and Peter. Back when I was in seminary, excuse me, back when I was in seminary years ago, that's a, that's a bad preacher joke. Back when I was in seminary, I had a professor that said that um, John and Peter likely had a rivalry and they were always comparing. Like you look at the disciples like, who's the greatest? Who's the most important? Jesus, who gets to ride shotgun? That's my translation of who gets to sit next to you at the table? Who's the most important? And in John chapter 20, you can actually see this rivalry, this comparison between Peter and John. Now, if I were Peter, I honestly probably wouldn't like John. I mean, I'd love him, but I may not like him. Any of you have your friends like that? Like you love him in the Lord, but you don't wanna be around him? John was annoying. I'll tell you why it's annoying. He referred to himself in third person. That's annoying. He called himself the one that people loved. Now, if I can just like, just speak into your life right now. If you refer to yourself in third person, just stop it now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, don't do that, okay? That's annoying. Well, Pastor Craig thinks, don't say that, don't say that. This is what John did, and this may be one of the reasons why he annoyed Peter. He referred to himself as the one, that, the disciple that Jesus loved. And what I wanna do is give you the context, and then I'm gonna show you something funny. The context of John 20, it was Sunday morning, the day of the resurrection, the biggest day in history. The tomb is now empty. Jesus is risen from the dead. So Jesus gave his life three days later. He is risen from the dead. And I want you to notice how many times John tells us that he's faster than Peter in a foot race. It's in the Bible. Don't miss it. Watch this. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. And John is faster in a 50 yard dash. Watch this. Verse two, John 20. So, so Mary came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, watch this, the one who Jesus loved. That's John, that's annoying. Can you agree that's annoying? Type that in the chat, that's annoying. So, so here's John referring to himself. She, she came to him and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Now count the times with me. How many times does he say it? So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, started for the tomb, both were running, but the other disciple, here's John talking about himself. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. There's one. Then Simon Peter came along, where was Peter? behind John, there's number two, and went straight into the tomb. Finally, the other disciple, that's John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. Three times, John tells us in his own gospel, I got to the tomb faster than Peter. Comparing, competing, I'm imagining this. The women come and say the tomb's empty and Peter and John are like, well, we gotta get there, let's get there, let's get there. And then they fast walk it, who's gonna be faster? Comparison, kills calling. It robs you from this. John compared himself to Peter. Peter compared himself to John. Who does Jesus like more? Who's most important? Uh, who should sit in the most important place? And maybe you do the same thing. Maybe you're a mom and you compare yourself to your annoying Pinterest mom friend. You know what I'm talking about? It's COVID-19 and she's making homemade goodies for the kids and they're doing crafts and they're playing games every day and you can't find your kids because you made them disappear because they were making you crazy and you never want to homeschool again as long as you live, right? You might compare marriages. It's this whole COVID-19 lockdown and this couple, they go on like little dates in their living room where they dress up and put candles on and they have family devotionals and they go on walks and you're just praying to make it through without making someone disappear in your own home. Your marriage is maybe a little bit struggling while so many people they're not, or it could be anything. She's got more followers, he's got more influence, she's in better shape than I am, they have more money, more bling, more whatever it is. Comparisons, it's, it's a curse and it robs us of calling. What's interesting about Peter and John is the story doesn't just end there, but if you know, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, Peter denied Jesus before uh, Jesus gave his life on the cross. 
Well, after Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus had this powerful moment with Peter where he basically reinstated him or he forgave him and he restored him back to his calling, his mission, his purpose. And he said to Peter, do, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, I do. And Jesus said, your purpose is go feed the sheep. That's, that's your calling. You, this is what you're called to do. Do you love me? Yes, yes. Then feed my sheep. That's your purpose. Now watch what Peter did. John 21, verse 20. Peter turned around and saw behind him the disciple that Jesus loved. So Jesus says, here's your calling. And the very next thing that Peter does is he looks at John. Peter, here's your calling. And Peter's comparing to John. Peter asked Jesus, what about him? What's his purpose? What, what, what's his calling? What, what's he gonna do? And Jesus replied, if you want him to remain alive until I return, what's that for you? As for you, follow me. As for you, feed my sheep. I came to tell somebody today, stop comparing your calling. Stop comparing what you were not designed to accomplish because you can't fulfill your calling, you can't fulfill God's purpose when you're comparing to somebody else. In fact, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. That's why some of you right now, you're miserable in your marriage because you're comparing your marriage to someone else's. You're, you're, you're miserable in what you have. You've got a nice place, you've got nice things, but you're comparing it. You're comparing your kids. Some of you, you're comparing your calling. I'm not as important and I'm not making this kind of a difference. And it's killing your calling. Embrace the truth, the reality that you are created by God, perfectly by God, to fulfill God's purpose for you. You have everything you need to do everything that God created you specifically to do. In fact, I love what the author to the Hebrews says about our focus. He says in Hebrews 12 verses one and two, let us run with perseverance. Man, how many of you know this season takes some perseverance? Let's not give up. Let's not grow weary in doing good. Let's remain faithful. Let's keep our eyes focused on the right thing. Let us run with perseverance. And then the author to the Hebrews Hebrews says, the race marked out for us. In other words, there is a race that you're called to run. Your race is your race. My race is my race. You can't win my race. I can't win your race. Run with perseverance, your race. Fulfilling your calling. Serving God's purpose for you. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, then what do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. We're fixing our eyes on Jesus. He's the prize. We're running the race that he created us to run, thinking about him, doing it for his glory. It's impossible for me to run someone else's race and to win. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. In fact, I ran track. I was like a track star in the eighth grade. Actually, I wasn't very good, but I did run in the eighth grade. And one of the things I remember was that uh, the fastest way to lose a race is to look over your shoulder. When you're running, you look straight ahead. The moment you look over the shoulder to see who else is running, who else is catching you, it breaks your stride, it breaks your momentum, and it takes you off of, out of your lane. The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Stop comparing your calling. You run your race. <laughs> you stay in your lane. I'll preach my sermon, someone else can make the tables that we sit on and enjoy great meals. You don't compare what you're doing with someone else because you are created to do what someone else is doing. Some of you might say, well, you know, Pastor Craig, you wouldn't struggle with kind of comparing or whatever. <laughs> in, in the early years of ministry, this about like took me out. Some, you might look at me now and say, well, you know, now that you've, you have a larger church and larger influence, you know, you, you, you must never, ever, ever battle with this. Oh my gosh, no. You, you can't out-succeed your insecurities, okay? 
It doesn't matter how big whatever grows you growing or how much of whatever you want you get, your insecurities are still there. And in the early years of ministry in my 20s and in my 30s, I, I, so much of the time I was running the race like this, who else is doing it? And how fast is their church growing and what, what kind of influence they have and you know, who's speaking at that conference and why didn't I get invited to that? And how come I'm not friends with so-and-so and, -so, and why, why, why am I not there? And one of the greatest revelations I had along the way, and I don't always live in this, but it was just realizing is I am not called to run someone else's race. I can't win someone else's race. And so there's great freedom now in looking at the people that are my friends and partners in ministry, not my competitors, not how do I rank compared to them, but my friends and partners in ministry and saying, win your race. Be the best at what you're created to be. Make a difference in the way that only you can make a difference. And it's freeing to say, that's not my lane. I'm in my lane. I'm gonna stay in my lane. I'm gonna keep my eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of my faith. I'm running the race he created me to run. Guess what race I can run? There's no one in the world that can love my bride the way I'm called to love my bride. There's no one married to Amy. That makes me pretty dang special that I get to be with her. That's my race. And I will lay down my life with great honor to serve you, nurture you, honor you in all that we do. Amy gave me six kids and they all faithfully love Jesus. That's a pretty big win. You get two of them going in the same direction at the right time, that's a big win. Six of them, that's a miracle. Like that's a miracle from heaven. And that, that's my race to help nurture them, to raise them. Uh, for whatever reason, I have the ability to help build leaders. We've got 34 of the greatest campus pastors in the world. 34 of the greatest worship pastors in the world. 34 of the greatest kids pastors in the world. 34 greatest of the student pastors in the world. And some of the greatest leaders anywhere, creating things like the YouVersion Bible app and, and, and Church Online and free resources. I, I help build leaders. That's my lane, that's what I do. And so with every bit of faith in me, I'm gonna wake up every day and say, I'm running my race. That's something that I can do. And in this season right now, when our church is spread out and we're not gathered, I wake up with everything in me thinking shepherd this flock, love these people, inspire them where they are to become more like Jesus, to glorify God, to recognize that God put inside of you exactly what he wanted to put inside of you, to do exactly what he created you to do. And just because you're limited right now in opportunity doesn't mean that you're stopped. A limited situation does not stop God's calling. His calling is on you, He is for you. He is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Feel His presence. Embrace His calling. Step into what He's called you to do to fulfill His calling for you. Keep your eyes on the prize, your eyes on Jesus. Just, just, you might just do this every now and then. It's like, what, what, what are you doing? I'm running my race. I'm, wh whatever your race is. Right now, it might be that you're getting your degree. And it may be online now, but you're getting your degree because you're called to this. And you know in the next season, you're gonna be fulfilling your calling then. You're just doing what you're called to do. It might be that you're leading a business. And it's a small business. It's not the biggest one, but you're leading with integrity and faithfulness and you're representing Jesus in all that you do, and everyone that you interact with know that your business is different, that you do things to honor God, and you're, you're just running your race. You might have some friends and, and, and you don't do some of the things they do in a, in a wilder lifestyle because you're called in a different lane. And they may laugh at you and they may not understand, but you just stay in your lane and you let your life be a witness saying, I'm running my race. You might have kids everywhere, you're up to your ears in diapers. You just change those diapers for the glory of God. This is the season you're in, you're just running your race. You're just being faithful where you are. You're just loving people. You're just making a difference. You're letting the spirit and the love of God flow in you and through you in all that you do. You're a faithful voice 
in your student ministry, reaching out to your Switch students even though you can't meet right now on Wednesday nights. You're bold online, sharing your faith. Your social media is not just about showing your fashion, it's about showing your faith that you can make a difference where you are. Do what you're created to do. What are you? Listen, you are the masterpiece of God created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. Long before you were ever born, God knew that at this moment, this time in history, you are perfectly created to point certain people to know him. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Stop comparing your calling. You can't win every race, but you can win yours. Step into it. Embrace his calling. We looked last week, David served God's purpose in his generation. One of the greatest things that we could ever know is that today I serve Jesus' purpose. Success isn't some goal you achieve out there in the future. Success isn't when we get back to life as normal. That's not success. Success is being faithful to Jesus today. Stop comparing. The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. God created you exactly where you are. He knew this whole situation would hit and he knew that you would have exactly what he needs to make a difference in the life of someone else. Quit comparing your calling. Step into your purpose to serve God and serve his people exactly where you are. Father, today, I thank you that your church is the church whether the doors are open or not. And I pray, oh God, that your church, your people would be inspired to serve your purpose for them. Stir up the gifts within them even where they are today to make a difference in this world, to serve you in all that they do. As you're praying today, wherever you are, those of you who say, yeah, I'm in, I wanna I want, I want serve God's purpose today. Just lift up your hands. You can just type it in the chat. I'm in, I wanna, I wanna serve God's purpose. I wanna make a difference. Father, I thank you that we don't have to wait until things go back to normal to make a difference in this world. God, use your church, stir up with them a passion to see the gifts that you've given them serve your purpose to make a difference. God, I pray you'd give them divine insight Give them an eyes to see needs in the world. Give them a heart to care, God, about those around them that are hurting. We thank you, God, for a church of people ready to serve, postured in position to do your will, to fulfill your purpose. God, there's a